Our next speaker needs little introduction. Thomas Theo is professor at York University and one of the leading voices in the area of theoretical psychology. He is the author of many books, among them the 2019 Outlines of Theoretical Psychology, Critical Investigations. Thomas is also the recipient of the 2019 Ted Sarban Prize. Much more could be said, yet I will leave it at that, so we have time to hear from Thomas about necropolitics, subhumans, and neoliberal mentality. Today I would like to talk about necropolitics, subhumans, and mental life. Borrowing from Habermas, we could for the sake of simplicity, but also representing actual trends, suggest that we have two basic knowledge interests left, represented in the A, instrumental sciences, and B, ethical critical sciences. Instrumental sciences provide goods, services, or ideological support for the status quo, for power, for a political economy. They are instrumental in the reproduction of neoliberal capitalism. They have advanced their status and benefit from financial rewards as long as, do, as they do not challenge existing structures and ideas. The ethical critical sciences challenge the status quo, current mentality and practice. For that very reason, and because they do not produce instrumental value, they have been on the retreat, and that includes the traditional humanities and social sciences. Admittedly, there may be more entanglement than suggested in this dualistic scheme. In the context of the COVID-19 crisis, it seems clear that the medical sciences have primacy. Treatment and vaccination require a biomedical approach. Of course, public health is based on some critical reflections on politics and economy and on the impact of the virus on diverse racialized groups, the poor, prisoners, women, migrants, frontline and precarious workers, and of course, the elderly. But even such reflections seem lost in the public to the primacy of biomedical work. For society and the academic community, it is less clear what the role of the ethical critical sciences amounts to. Public intellectuals have contributed their ideas to the debate with reflections on surveillance, social media, technology, or a better organization of society. They provide interpretations of the historical, social, and cultural meanings of the COVID-19 crisis. Psychology is very much absent in these debates, or to be more precise, in having a unique voice. Biomedical experts draw on common sense psychology to make behavioral recommendations, and they don't seem to need a psychological expert. Even the few clinical psychologists talk publicly about dealing with anxiety, depression, loneliness, resilience, when it comes to isolation, draw on basic recommendations. So mainstream psychology is trying to catch up with its instrumental purpose, asking for contributions to journals, offering or recommending grant applications that would show the relevance of psychology. I'm sure that there will be numerous empirical studies that look at the relationship between a whole series of variables. My question is, what can the psychological humanities or critical reflections in psychology contribute to the debate? Can anything be learned from the ethical critical sciences during the coronavirus crisis? So first I thought doing a discourse analysis of the debates by leading public intellectuals. I also thought about doing an analysis of war metaphors in the crisis, comparing American, Canadian, British with German and Austrian debates. 
However, there is a topic that is closer to my heart. I suggest and have observed that we are moving into an increasing acceptance of fascist thinking and doing in our culture. In other words, I believe there's an actuality and modernity to fascist ideology. I also have biographical reasons in understanding that fascist thinking, feeling and being permeate actions and have re-emerged in liberal democracies. I grew up in an Austrian village very close to a facility where persons with mental disabilities were taken care of by Catholic sisters. In 1941, the patients were removed and sent to, among others, Schloss Hartheim, the center of the Nazi T4 euthanasia program, where they were killed. What kind of public and private psychological state do you need to make that happen? I understand that ideological arguments, political economic calculations, it costs too much, eugenic and biological discourses are invoked, but of all of these require acceptance that people are disposable. The psychological humanities can contribute to the debate by understanding the psychological conditions for the possibility of necropolitics. The term necropolitics was coined by Mbembe, the Cameroonian philosopher, who analyzed the modern sovereign power that decides who can live, who can die, and who can be terrorized. It is not so much a right to kill, but the ability to expose people to death. From the sovereign right to kill, which is, of course, uh, a, a stream of thought developed by Foucault to, quote, the capacity to define who matters and who does not, who is disposable and who is not, unquote. And that applies to the colonies, but in this crisis also to the center. Whose death counts during a crisis such as migration or a pandemic? Although the topic is social and political, I want to understand the mental conditions for accepting the idea that certain people are disposable, let me call it diable, and that we create not life worlds, but death worlds. So this is a term also used by Mbembe. In the context of migration, I argue that we mentally operate with an ontology of subhumanism. The assumption that certain people are not really human, not human anymore, and for the reason their deaths do not mean anything. They can be exposed to death. Necropolitics translated into fascist terminology means lives that are not worth living and is based in the migration debate on an ontology of subhumanism which is the focus of this paper today. Lives that are not worth anything or not worth much in the pandemic debate may be based on subhumanism, but we find clearer political economic debates about the disposability of precarious workers, the elderly and the marginalized. And we find arguments about forced sacrifices for the greater good, which often means a capitalist economy. For example, the elderly are too expensive and the capitalist economy too important to hold up its accumulation processes. A Texas lieutenant governor spoke out against public health restrictions and he asks, quote, as a senior citizen, are you willing to take a chance on your survival in exchange for keeping the America that all America loves for your children and grandchildren, unquote. Basically, elderly should risk death if it keeps the American economy running. People are diable because of the logic of capitalism. Even more explicit was a California planning commissioner who suggested that letting nature run its course would be beneficial to social life, including lower health care costs, more jobs and more housing for others. He concluded that a herd, quote, allows the sick, the old, the injured to meet its natural course in nature, unquote. Similar argument was made by 
uh, a former New Jersey governor who suggested that America has to accept deaths in order to reopen the economy, or the mayor of Las Vegas who wanted to use her city as a control case to see what happens to theft numbers once you open the city to business. What kind of subjectivity does one need to accept the patients in nursing homes or long-term care facilities and the often precarious staff where the most vulnerable members of society are diable? What kind of mental life does one need to accept that migrants can be treated as subhumans? I should add that I do not reduce subjectivity into internal processes, but connected with the logic of systems such as neoliberal capitalism that reinforces fascist ideologies and necropolitical public discourses. The ontology of subhumanism and the talk about diability remain deeply fascist tropes. I cannot develop here a deep analysis of the COVID-19 crisis and focus on migration where fascist thinking and doing is highly visible. So let me be let me come now to the necropolitics of migration. At the 58th Venice Biennale in 2019, the Swiss artist Christoph Büchel exhibited the Barca Nostra in the Arsenale, Arsenale, the former naval shipyard in Venice. Büchel recovered the sunken wreck, a ship that had capsized in a collision with a freighter that had been sent to its aid from the ocean close to the Libyan coast. As the New York Times pointed out, our ship represents one of the deadliest wrecks in the area's history, having resulted in 800 migrant deaths in 2015. The Trump administration separates migrant children from parents, restricts access to asylum in violation of international law, launches tear gas on running migrants and young children, considers indefinite detention of migrant families, and accepts migrants' death deaths due to poor medical care. According to reports, migrant children have been denied sufficient food and have been held in jail-like facilities with limited access to showers, clothes, and toothbrushes. Similarly, in a Texas detention center, children have been reportedly forced to sleep on concrete floors as punishment for perceived transgressions. Indeed, repercussions ranging from removing educational and recreational activities to putting children into cages and separating children from their parents appear to comprise a strategy of preventing migrants from coming into the United States. So what about subhumanism and subhumanization? Important and sophisticated psychological studies on migration issues have been published. I offer a complementary socio-subjective or psychocultural hermeneutic analysis. It attempts to make sense of what is percolating in the dominant culture at this time, taking historical continuities into account. I do not take the perspective of the migrant, nor do I make the migrant into a problem, Rather, I suggest understanding conditions for the possibility of actions described above. Similar to studies on privilege or whiteness, the analysis attempt to understand the dominant culture, its spirit and ontologies that engender institutional actions as well as individual behaviors. Observing social, institutional and individual behaviors against migrants. I propose that in the context of ideas about the essence, nature, and character of humans or human groups, subhumanism as a cultural, affective, symbolic, distributed, and normalized ontology has re-emerged. By cultural, I also mean that notions of supremacy and inferiority have plagued Western cultures at least since colonialism and that they have never completely disappeared, not even in science or psychology, as works on scientific racism show. Subhumanism is an affective ontology, reforming the cognitive and emotional contents of the mind, as well as guiding actions. 
Various ideas of substandard appearances form the basis of an ontology that divides humanity into humans and subhumans. This ontology is primarily effective, affording highly emotional reactions towards things real or imagined regarding people who show attributes or behaviors that are different from us, us of course in quotation marks, but who come to live, but who come or live with us. Subhumanism forms an ideology less in the meaning of false consciousness, although I'm not discounting that aspect, but rather in the meaning of working on negative affects emerging from images and imaginations widely shared via social and mass media, and in consequence, reaching a significant number of people in a given context. It is an ontology that is distributed, picked up, and normalized by individuals in cultures who already possess a pre-understanding of various historical forms of subhumanism. Subhumanism can supersede rational and religious discourses, and its strength lies in the obviousness of its ontology. Judgments regarding subhumanized people are generalized and normalized to the extent that many people in a mainstream culture or group agree with those ideas. Mediated through mass and social media, subhumanism nowadays is often an implicit ontology of what it means to be below humans, but there exist explicit appeals to it as well, and I will discuss that a little bit later. Within an ontology of subhumanism, neither the mental life nor the body of the subhuman matters. Subhumanism is not confined to colonial experiences and practices, but rather reflects a pliable concept of power. Indeed, the brilliance of this ontology consists in its malleability, as it can be extended to homeless people, persons with disabilities, prisoners, religious or visible minorities, and other marginalized groups, and of course, elderly people in nursing homes. Further, physical and psychological harm to subhumans are not worthy of theoretical or practical reason, because subhumans have no place in our civilized society beyond being a source of fear and anger in the dominant population. Subhumanism has a continuing history in Western thought. If one were to discuss reasons for its historical re-emergence, one needs to address crisis phenomena of neoliberal capitalism, right-wing political turn in many Western countries, politicians who make careers on anti-immigrant rhetoric and practice, and anxieties of displacement by individuals who are told and may actually experience that there is not enough for everybody in a human-made competitive and climate-changing world. Clearly, an analysis of the re-emergence of subhumanism needs to be connected with the socio-political and economic re-emergence of right-wing thinking and doing in the West. As an ontology, subhumanism remains silent in times of stability and without purpose in Western democracies as a possible technology of power for states, institutions, or persons. Subhumans are below the standard of an imagined ideal of the human. It can reach from notions of defectiveness to the idea that others are animals. Subhumanism, subhumanism is practically imported for a fascist being in the world that enlists this ontology as a strategy of identity. Moreover, to understand the social behavior of states, governments, institutions, and persons in the context of migration in advanced countries, I suggest analyzing the role of subhumanism as something that underlies these practices. Subhumanism also challenges the rhetoric of empathetic, relational and dialogical concepts of human interaction because they do not apply to subhumans in this dividing ontology. The re-emergence of subhumanism is more than a politics of us versus them, as Stanley points out in his book on fascism. 
Rather, the phenomenon is about putting them below the standard of humanity and about acting on that or about making that happen with the support of either political leaders or a significant number of people among us. Admittedly, it is a thin line to move from us versus them to an ontology of humans versus subhumans. We can define fascism regarding effective ontologies of human nature then in terms of making this move. Of course, political fascism provides the symbolic and practical articulation and justification of this uh, framework. The political and psychological realities connect when this division becomes consciously or unconsciously merged and habituated and when this fascist being in the world thrives and becomes normalized a standard ontology. Whereas dehumanization is a process and practice, subhumanism is an ontology. Subhumanism can rely on dehumanizing people, but often persons are already subhumanized and dehumanizing just reinforces the subhuman status. Some migrants are understood as subhuman before they are maltreated, and others are dehumanized during abuse, rendering, rendering them subhumans in this process. Sometimes an ontology of subhumanism allows them to be treated in a dehumanizing way. Subhumanism in the migration debate operates with affective images or imaginations that underlie rationalizations and symbols that are largely negative and that are widely distributed in order to allow them to take hold in a culture or subculture. Subhumanism orients people towards considering other human beings as substandard. The act of dehumanizing people and the actions against them lead to conditions and outcomes that reinforce and justify the ontology of a subhuman in a dialectical way. If one puts people into horrendous conditions and exposes them to those circumstances, it is likely that humans will show restricted actions that in turn confirm the ontology of the subhuman. Processes of subhumanization are possible because migrants are considered subhuman and they become subhuman because they have been subhumanized. This dialectical process, this perfect circle, leads us to accept the ontology of subhuman migrants. In this line of thinking, I'm not discounting xenophobia, ethnocentrism, racism, authoritarian personalities, the consequences of neoliberal economies that augment inequalities, status anxieties, competition, nationalism, capitalism, poverty, and environmental destruction. I am proposing that in inhuman social behaviors are possible because you operated are motivated by an underlying and re-emerging ontology of the subhuman. <clears throat> so I want to now discuss the sources of subhumanism. There is a long history of eugenic, colonial, and scientific racist writings that engender subhumanism. Yet the ontology of the subhuman is broader than the concept of inferior races because it has a wider applicability within and between groups. Historically, this stream of argument was developed by Stoddard's analysis of the underman <clears throat> when he required a concept that not only contained primitives and degenerates that were considered inferior non-European races or mongrelized populations, but it also referred to a person in society who, quote, measures under the standards of capacity and adaptability imposed by the social order in which he lives, unquote. The term included not only inferior races, but also lower classes, the proletariat and Bolsheviks. Stoddard needed a term that not only denoted what he perceived as dangers and menaces from outside, but also within the United States. 
Classical race theories were insufficient for this purpose and for proposed eugenic practices. In the preface of his 1922 book, The Revolt Against Civilization, The Menace of the Underman, Stoddard explicitly mentioned psychology uh, uh, as a science and intelligence testing as a source that guided his investigations. The flexibility of the concept subhuman can also be in, in the SS Educational Manual, originally published in 1935 and used throughout the Nazi regime. Heinrich Himmler wrote the editorial to the just over 50 page booklet, Der Untermensch, the subhuman. The pamphlet is short on text, but prolific in its images, supporting the argument that the subhuman works with affective images and imaginations. It provides photos, pictures of Mongol hordes, of Jews contrasted with Aryan faces, portrays female Jews as prostitutes and partisans, contrasts smiling Germans with bitter-looking foreign women and starving children and beggars with orderly German people. The German home is presented as a location of culture and cleanliness, as compared to the Soviet home, replete with rags, dirt and vermin. Similar comments are made about cities, rural areas, religion and art, where subhuman art is contrasted with human art. Torture, mass killings and the slaughter of humans are arguably ironically attributed to the subhuman. The booklet does not, however, provide a scientifically developed concept of the subhuman or anything equal to scientific racism that relies on empirical studies legitimized by scientific tables and scientific graphs. Rather, the ontology operates with an affective symbolic imagery, supplemented with short comments referring to the substandard, deviant being and actions of subhumans. Indeed, in this logic, classical race theories would be too limited in seeking to justify uh, all killings in the war project. The Nazi pamphlet considered Jews to be the leaders of the subhuman category, but also includes blacks, Soviets, Stalin, German communists, and even Western enemies of Germany. Churchill and Roosevelt are identified as subhuman. The pamphlet was relying on an existing discourse or a code that was acceptable and agreed upon by significant segments of the population. Of course, current subhuman imagery needs to be updated in the context of the neoliberal reality of social insecurity and inequality. Affective images and imaginations and comments about apparently uncivilized agency on the background of the current migration debate represent new codes for depicting subhumans. Persons in a caravan that collectively make the journey to the Mexican-American border do not follow American standards of social order. Migrants climbing over a border fence do not follow civilized behavior. Running to a new country is not standard behavior. Waiting in overcrowded boats to enter harbor in a foreign destination without resources is an affront to a market economy. Indeed, the very act of separating parents and children, the idea of a wall, of not providing enough food for migrants, reinforces migrants as subhuman. In order to determine whether a person is subhuman or not, one needs no scientific theories and measurements because the answer is self-evident. We do not need concepts based on scientific literature because we can rely on our senses or imagined visualizations. Photos, films, talks, and fantasies of disorderly migrants, not scientific evidence, constitute the migrant as subhuman. Right-wing supporters of anti-immigration sentiments have expressed explicit commitment to subhumanism. Miriam Rüdel, the right-wing FPÖ party functionary in Austria, identified male refugees as subhumans in her Facebook account. 
a Canadian Yellow Vest protester who sees immigration as the, at the core issue of politics, referred to immigrants as subhuman. In the ProPublica report on the Border Patrol Facebook group, it was noted the posted messages described migrants as, quote, gourds, wild as shitbags, beaners, and subhuman, unquote. The German uh, magazine Der Spiegel reported that the 2016 Munich shooter who killed nine persons referred in his pamphlet to alien subhumans that he intended to execute. In contrast, Barack Obama, criticizing current sociopolitical trends, has rejected the idea that one can refer, quote, to other people as subhuman or imply that America belongs to just one certain type of people, unquote. Needing to address the usage of these terms shows that subhumanist discourses have become normalized within significant segments of North American and European populations in the context of migration debates. So what is the difference between subhumanism and racism? Subhumanism and racism share certain commonalities, including the activity of racializing or subhumanizing people. Racism that operates with a long tradition of science, with institutional, political, and individual supports, can stand on its own or it become an element in subhumanism. Although racism accounts for aspects of what is happening in the migration debate, Theories of racism have not provided a sufficient account of the complexity or intersectionality of the problem. For instance, it would be difficult to label many refugees from the Middle East as constituting an inferior race, although they may be perceived as having an inferior religion from the perspective of a supremacist ideology. That's what makes migrants subhuman is not necessarily their race, but their substandard, disorderly, uncivilized, or abnormal behavior and appearance by the standards of mainstream culture into which they migrate. Indeed, the very fact of being a migrant can render them subhuman. This does not mean that anti-immigrant ideas and actions are not nourished by the concept of race, but that often they are fostered by an ontology of the subhuman. White refugees can be constructed as subhuman, not on the basis of racializing processes, but on the basis of subhumanizing processes. The visual actualization of the subhuman allows for more flexibility in strategies of power than does the concept of race. Under the right circumstances, any person can be deemed a subhuman when their behavior does not fit a standard or a norm anymore or when limited behavior is forced onto them. In contrast, rich tourists from Asia or Africa are not deemed subhuman as long as they share the hallmarks of standy, meaning wealthy civilization. In fact, rich visible visitors are welcome, even if they may still be racialized and, with this, and within this process be considered inferior, as long as they follow normative tourist or business behavior. Because of the habitus and wealth, they are not perceived as belonging to the subhuman category as long as they behave. However, their status as human can change quickly to subhuman if they do not act according to expected standards. So let me now discuss a little bit the question of subhumanism and fascism. The target of this reflection is also the fascism in us all, in our heads, in our everyday behavior. That is a Foucault quote. I suggest that the move from us versus them to human versus subhuman is, a, is at the core of a fascist affective ontology. It may be part of our mental heritage to validate us versus them, which then opens up debates about who is constituted as us, and them in a given context, and there's clearly social constructions involved in this process. Yet the human-subhuman distinction and its application in the context of immigration expresses a continuity of fascist thinking and feeling. To be more precise, the symbolic division of humanity into humans and subhumans 
given new content and particularities that have salience in our time and within liberal democracies, particularities which makes the division in some respect different from that of early 20th century fascism, entails a re-emergence of an old anthology. A fascist affective symbolic mental life may be engendered by the assumption that resources are insufficient to meet everyone's needs. This assumption still plays an important role in capitalism that thrives on competition, greed and an elbow culture. Because in my mind there are insufficient resources for everyone, my family and I, perhaps my community, need to get as large a piece of the limited pie as possible, which is not imaginable if I share my piece of the pie with subhumans, the undeserving and the lazy. The idea that we do not share the world with all other human beings leads to a world in which the subhuman becomes a logical element of neglect, exclusion or extermination. Subhumanism is also based on an ethical particularism or better an instrumentalism towards other people embodied and enacted in daily lives through various exclusions. Besides the political, economic, environmental and psychological enactment of subhumanism, fictional visual media also play a role in distributing ontologies of subhumanism. When thinking about successful films and TV shows, zombies or The Walking Dead, that depict literally a class of subhumans to which human behaviors need not apply. Zombies can be killed, maimed, destroyed, burned, or as used as we please and as needed. Not only is morally unproblematic to kill such subhumans, it is necessary in order for humans to survive. Protagonists who show compassion for the humanity of zombies end up dead, which thus makes it our sacred duty to kill zombies. Zombie depictions are also reinforce the idea that limited resources for the living necessitate inhuman behavior. It is not suggested here that fictional accounts are responsible for the practice of subhumanism. Rather, such accounts support pre-existing ontologies that easily identifiable subhumans do not have the same rights as humans and that subhumans can be used and discarded according to the needs of humans. Such fictional accounts which are consumed by millions of viewers, divide the world into humans and subhuman and reinforce the ontology that a subhuman can be treated differently, justifiably so. Such visualizations also demonstrate that we do not need scientific definitions of zombies or of the subhuman, because we all can see such subhumans. The stretch to hordes of immigrants making the trek to our house Climbing walls, stealing our way of life, killing and raping our kind is a short one towards fascist being. So coming to the final part where I ask about the role of empathy. We might expect psychologists to propose psychological solutions to the problem of subhumanization. In that vein, psychologists have offered up empathy as a psychological category with the potential to overcome divisions in the migration debate. Although empathy may represent a necessary condition for overcoming such divisions, I suggest that empathy is not sufficient for this task as it is not oblique to the concept of the subhuman. The issue is not that North Americans or Europeans lack empathy, but rather that they lack empathy for people construed as rapists, invaders, or in short, subhuman. The problem is not a general empathy deficit, but rather that empathy has become particular and is afforded only to certain humans. This empathy selectiveness is at the heart of the problem. Empathy selectiveness, refusal or withdrawal, nested within the human subhuman divide, is once again a characteristic of our cultural zeitgeist and represents a significant element in the ontology of subhumanism. Because the merchants, dealers and consumers of subhumanism operate with an affective imagery that reinforces an empathy void for the subhuman immigrant, 
and because cows disorder and disease are associated with a migrant. The migrant is not afforded empathy, but rather contempt and disgust. Humanitarians and supporters of a human migration policy may use effective images too, in order to counter the subhuman narrative and to elicit empathy with a migrant. Such humanitarians may show images such as that of Alan Kurdi, the three-year-old boy who drowned in the Mediterranean Sea while escaping war in his home country, lying face down on the beach, wearing the clothes of a typical European child. This empathy soliciting photo, countering the message of the subhuman and showing humanity's shared responsibility for the other, may have increased support for asylum seekers for a period of time. I caution, however, against operating solely with images to counter the ontologies of the subhuman. The effect may be temporary and the effort becomes a struggle of who has the better photos, a competition for human versus subhuman affects. In order to be effective and to counter an effective symbolic subhumanism, photographs and images need to be increasingly shocking and extreme, which contributes to the normalization of death and horror and which might even reinforce the ontology of the subhuman. Challenging the ontology of subhumanism must go beyond psychological empathy and involve caring for the generalizability and universality of human beings. We can resist subhuman particularism with an ethics of generalization that includes cognitive, affective, agentic, personal and community activities. And that reminds us that we all human beings all in the same boat, both literally and symbolically. Yet although psychological competencies and morality are necessary conditions for the possibility of overcoming subhumanism, they are not sufficient. Rather, the task of overcoming subhumanism will require, in the main, a collective anti-fascist political and economic praxis that has the commonwealth of all human beings in mind. In addition, it is not the theory of the privileged alone to envision abstract forms of resistance against subhumanism. If one takes the idea of resistance seriously, seriously, it will also come from the marginalized themselves, who employ infra-politics to resist domination, which may remain unnoticed in the self-reflexive ivory towers of academia. Thank you.